Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Wyndham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Wyndham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. They've been part of Jewett City since 1937, but it almost ended a year later when the Hurricane of 38 ripped across the region. We talked to the D'Amico family, owners of Jewett City Florist and Greenhouse, about their 86 years in business. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. The D'Amico family are well known in Jewett City for their hidden gem of a florist and greenhouse business that's almost hidden in the downtown area. It came into the family in 1937 and, as we'll hear, came crashing down around their ears a year later as the hurricane of 1938 ripped across southern New England, carving a path of devastation and destruction in its wake. But the family rolled up their sleeves, as families do, and it was back to business. I caught up with the D'Amico's at the florist and greenhouse recently, and and we begin the interview with Lewis James D'Amico Jr. as he recalls those early days. The beginning, as I was told, because I wasn't here then, in 1937, my grandfather purchased the greenhouse from Mr. Young, A.A. Young, who was an entrepreneur in town. And basically, he felt he could grow carnations, and that's what we were growing here at the time. So he uh, bought the business in 1937, and in 1938, the hurricane of 38 almost put us out of business that quick. It was uh, devastating, devastating. But the family pitched in, and um, between the family and their friends, they actually had to rebuild a lot of the greenhouse and make it sturdy, and, and it's still standing to this day. How big's the family, and, and can you remember, or you know, again from the stories, how long it took? Because these aren't small greenhouses here. And I'm sure it's like took plenty of glass to replace after the hurricane ripped through. A lot of glass. We have about an acre under glass is about the, if you took the dimensions of all the greenhouses. Again, they started after the hurricane, which was in October. And from my recollection, they had it up and running before winter started, where they were able to replace the glass. They worked diligently, you know, fix the framework and replace all the glass. Don't ask me where they got it all. I couldn't tell you, but uh, they worked hard. And again, we were a family in Jewish City. There was four brothers and three sisters. There were seven total. And they had a lot of friends in the area. And the friends really helped pitch in and um, they rebuilt it. It's interesting listening to this because of course as we all know we've just been through a pandemic hopefully coming through the end of it and we've got supply chain issues. You can imagine back then it wasn't such a global world and as you say a tornado you know hurricane sorry ripped through the place smashed so much in this area and then to as you say to try and find all of this in what seems like a relatively short space of time because it must have been absolutely essential to get the business back oh, under glass. It was they had to protect it from the frost because the carnations were in the greenhouse everything was planted again it almost put them out of business but they all pitched in and somehow my uncle was here he could tell you more in detail but there's no longer no longer with us so uh, and back then we had proper new england winters with oh, feet yeah. of snow and you know not some of this uh, like milder stuff we get now which is still you know we'd rather not have it of course of course it was it was tough it was very tough back then and i think the furnaces were Coal fired, so they had to shovel coal at night to uh, to keep the heat. And um, again, the family all pitched in together. They all worked hard. Tell us a little bit about your history with this, because you know you still work here. You're still very much part of this business. What got you into it? I mean, obviously it was a family affair, but I mean you could have done anything. But obviously you stepped in, stepped up, and you're part of this. A little bit sad. My last thing in the world would be to own this business when I was in college. I have an accounting degree, and I was going to be an accountant. I graduated in 1971, May, June of 71, looking for a position, you know, in the field. And then my dad died in a accident back in October of 71. And my wedding day was in November of 71. Everything was happening very quickly. And the day he died, I talked with my, my uncles and I said, if you want me in the business, I'd love to come in. 
And they, you know, I'm not going to say I was the best worker growing up and as a teenager, but I really took to it. And they gave me a junior partnership for three years. And if it worked, I would take over his 25% of the business, which was my dad's. It has worked. I came into the business full time and I haven't looked back. My wife's involved with the business, of course, my two sons uh, all got involved too, but... Yeah, and my uncles, um, over the years, you know, they were getting older. You know, they were probably in their late 50s, early 60s. I was 21, 22 years old, so how much longer were they going to work? And they worked. They worked till almost, um, they were 75, 80, 80 years old. They all worked. Business still continues. And I guess that finance degree came in handy because I guess you must be the money man, really. Well, I, I do help control it but believe it or not Lewis is a money man he does all uh, he pays the bills and he uh, my wife takes all the money and she gets it over to the bank and he spends it all so that's how how it works so whatever's left over we're able to keep some but yeah I'm very involved with the financial part of it we're going to talk to both your sons in just a moment I just want to ask you one final question before we like have a chat with Lewis one of your sons what keeps getting you up every morning you know you've been doing this for years now you clearly enjoy it you only have to look around I mean it's it's a it's a, a nice um you know environment here full of beautiful flowers but business is challenging so what keeps you going well I guess I love it it's it's all I know right now and um I have no problem getting up on Monday morning any morning of the week and coming up here and every day is a new day every day is a challenge and some days you really work hard, and some days you can. Uh, I can go golfing in the afternoon, which is my forte in the afternoons. I sneak out. But, again, I'm kind of semi-retired, so the kids run it. Uh, let them take, take over. But there's no problem, no problem getting up, no problem going to work. I really enjoy it. Actually, there is just one thing I want to ask you before I so like ask Lewis some questions. You'd mentioned while we were having like our little pre-recordings of like chat, carnations were the big thing back then for your business that you grew so many that you were probably at least the biggest carnation grower in eastern Connecticut, possibly in New England. Why did you stop the carnations? Because I mean that that's not a thing anymore, is it? No, it isn't. Carnations were very, very popular. It's still a very popular flower, but. You couldn't buy a good carnation. You couldn't just go somewhere and, and buy a 500 carnations. You had to grow them and pick them. And, and we used to supply all the florists, and we still supply the florists in the area. But it came out that um, South America, especially the Colombian market, really brought a flower in for a cheaper price, no labor, and um, they ship them up. And to this day, they still ship them every week, and we still buy them, and they, they last a long time, and they're beautiful. So because of the supply and demand, we could buy what we need. A lot less work in the greenhouse. We, the greenhouse has done a 180. We're very much into plants now, and especially the holidays. We just finished Easter, sold every Easter plant we had. Now we're getting into Mother's Day and the whole spring planting season. So it's a very busy, busy time of the year. Let's bring your son, Lewis, in as well. Lewis, great to talk to you. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with the business, because as Dad said, you know, you're in control of the money side of it as well. But there's obviously multiple things that you and your brother do. So just give us a, as a, like a, a hint of what it is, you know, it's like what your day involves. Get here in the morning and get the flowers out. And pretty much I take care of the retail part of the business, meaning in wholesale for flower-wise going in and out cut flowers you know, for arrangements and deliveries for around town, funerals, weddings, everyday work. And then also the wholesale part is packing orders for to deliver to other florists in the area. Yeah, because you're, I mean, you're a wholesaler as well, aren't you? So, I mean, have you got a, a fairly big sort of like, um, sort of like business area? Because, I mean, this, you know, it's, it's a big rural area, but then there's many cities around as well. Yeah, we go as far as Hartford, out to Groton, uh, New London, Norwich area, and uh, up to Danielson area. So all of Eastern Connecticut, really? Yep, exactly, yes. So what got you into it? Because, I mean, you know, obviously it's a family business. Your, your dad's told us his side of it. I mean, you do other things as well, other than yeah, this. Yeah. But what got you into the family business, as it were? I grew up in all my life and come up here and we used to get a bucket. And if I filled it up with weeds, I'd, you know, picking weeds in the greenhouse, I'd get a nickel. You know, that was the big deal growing up as, as a kid and just be here all the time. And then uh, I graduated from high school, went to college for two years up in Franklin, Mass, Dean, got my associate's degree, and then 
I always came back on the weekends to work and then came back home area and uh, went to Eastern at night and got my bachelor's, finished my bachelor's, but worked here during the day. So, and just family business, you know, just was part of the family and never left. What's it like working with family? Because actually a lot of small businesses, and of course, and, and I'm not saying this is necessarily a small business, it's a relatively large business, but you take my point, it's not some big corporation, but, you know, small to medium businesses are the backbone of America and a lot of them are actually family owned. What's it like working with family? Because business can be challenging at the best of times, can't it? Oh, a lot of yelling. A lot of yelling. No, it's good. It's good. But it's just when you work with your parents and your brother and sometimes things get out of hand a little. But overall, it's it's a great relationship. Yeah. And, and it's great to see my parents every day and my brother too every day. And it's an every day. It's seven days a week. I was going to say, can you actually switch off from it at all? Or do you end up having like conversations around like the Sunday dinner table, you know, obviously about business as well? No, pretty much business stays in-house. So then when we're out of here, we're not, not really business oriented. Because this is a high pressure business. I mean, people just like turn up at nurseries and at, at sort of like in florists and whatever and just see these lovely flowers and they don't realize half the work that goes into it. But there is a lot of work involved in this, isn't there? Yes, and a lot of stuff is, of, you know, if it's a funeral, it's usually some, the next day or whatever, so you have to have the stuff get done before the service, of course. Weddings are a little advanced, and holidays you know it's coming, but you still got to prep. Easter is a busy week, Mother's Day is a busy week, Valentine's is a busy day, Christmas is a busy month. And then there's the seasonality, and your dad, was, of course, was talking about, obviously, certain holidays as well, things like Mother's Day. I mean, obviously, a big day for flowers, etc. I mean, there's other big days as well. You've got the greenhouses, so obviously, to a certain degree, you can control the, the growth and, and the flowers and things like that. But I'm, I'm guessing you're still sort of, to a certain degree, the weather can play a part in this and, and could ruin things? It could. It slows down. You know, if it's bad weather during those holidays, it's definitely it's a little slower. Usually for plant-wise the plants go people plant especially during covid it was very busy why do you think that was i mean it sounds a bit of a dumb question but did you sort of like ever work out why because i mean i know people were out walking but it's like it wouldn't necessarily strike me that like oh yeah i must go and buy some extra flowers because of covid i think there's this home looking for stuff to do exactly and just to have stuff on their table or in their yard to plant their yard and stuff it was big big last few years because of that reason we have just been joined by the other brother let's have a chat with you Brent, what's your involvement here? You're, you've come in. It looks like you've been working hard, so you're sweating. I mean, as we as we record this today, actually, it's 90 degrees outside. So you know that. There's a big old jug of water there. Tell us what you've been up to. Just taking care of the plants. Getting that time right now. You know, everyone's weather's breaking. People are itching, ready to get outside, you know, decorate their house. I'm ready to get rid of everything so I can go hang out and drink some beers or something, you know? What's your day-to-day like? Seven days a week. We are farmers. Well, I'm a farmer. Just like they're going out taking care of their animals, we're taking care of the greenhouse. I got good help, so, you know, helps out. Give us a bit of a sense of, of your day. I know you just said it's seven days a week. So for the listeners, as we said, you know, they, they turn up, they buy their flowers, they order their flowers. We've got no idea what it takes mm-hmm. to obviously get those. You know, what time are you starting at the day? Give us a sense of what your day actually involves. What are you doing? Well, I mean, we have, um, I didn't hear what you said to my dad and my brother, but, you know, we have a wholesale side. We do cut flowers. You know, we have a busy on the retail side. So we kind of hit both ends. Come here, cut the flowers, see what orders we have kind of going on. Help starts arriving. I like to get the water and done first, and then we can kind of shuffle things around, see what's going on. I mean, I like to get here before them. I like to be here at 7 o'clock, you know, and then, but normally 8 o'clock, doors open, everyone's here. Talk us through some of the stuff that you're working on at the moment, because as we record this, it's mid-April. Of course, you know, like any business, you're always thinking ahead for, you know, the things that are coming up. So give us a sense of some of the stuff you're working on. Well, Easter just got over. We're fortunate. We're open year-round, so we're heating, you know, we're heating these greenhouses year-round. A lot of greenhouses don't do that they start opening them around february ish but right now we're opening things up spacing things out we have order you know we're almost like 90 percent automated here so meaning automatic watering so it helps us to be able to you know help customers do what we have to do you know i have two girls out there right now and you know that's what they're doing they're they're spacing stuff out they're putting our drip lines in and every day is just less that we have to worry about watering just kind of turn some switches on and make sure that you know the food's there and monitor things your dad said when we were talking to him earlier that many, many years ago, it was all about carnations and then carnations, you know, sort of like fell out of favour because they were able to be grown cheaper elsewhere. What sorts of things are sort of like popular now? Because even in the floristry industry, in the plant industry, things come into fashion, they fall out of fashion, yeah. don't they? Well, I know when I took over 
15 years ago now, like actually running the greenhouse, we probably grew 2,000 hangers. Now we're growing over 4,000. Our volume has risen, you know, just because we had the space, we started filling it. We are the hidden gem in the area because of the things that we have here. It's just, you know, you go to, I mean, not that, you know, a Home Depot, a Walmart, you know, uh, whatever, Lowe's, fine, you know, they have stuff, but it's not going to be taking care of the quality as a greenhouse atmosphere. When you say hangers, what do you mean? Is that hanging plants? Hanging plants that we do. You know, hangers, four-inch material, stationary pots. And what's some of the things that you like about, you know, doing this job? Because you have to want to do it. It's not a case of like, yeah, I'm just going to turn up. I mean, there still has to be a passion there. Even you said like you've been here 15 years. So what's what keeps you going? Uh, I think just the way I was raised, plain and simple. I don't know, just get the work done. You know, like that's what it comes down to. Keep him happy. <laughs> But, uh, but no, that's what it really comes down to. It's, uh, it's a lot. People that actually know how to run greenhouses, and there's a lot of good ones out there, I'm telling you, it's a project. It's not just plant a plant and just, you know, I tell a lot of people, because I live in town, oh, your house looks beautiful, and I do window box in front of my house. What do you do? I'm consistent. That's what, the, that's what the greenhouse industry, if you're consistent, you're watering your plants, you're not forgetting, you'll have success. And how tough an industry is it? Because, again, you know, all business has its particular sort of like challenges. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges for this type of of industry? I think for me, just not that we try to have any kind of pests, to be honest with you, you know, like, you know, but uh, we went a lot with uh, all natural stuff. You know, I'm actually using biological insects to fight the insects that will actually hurt the plant instead of maybe going around and using some kind of chemical you know that's what i've been actually exploring the last like five years and i've been seeing it make a huge difference you know i'm not dealing with chemicals i'm using something biological that's safe for everyone you know safe for the plant safe safe for the environment kind of you know the food chain if you get what i'm saying so that's something that sort of like sets you apart because, you know, not dissing, obviously, the big box stores. But like you said, you can go there. They don't have the expertise. They do their very best. And, yeah, you might get it cheaper, but it probably lasts like probably a quarter of the time. They're not cheap anymore, the box stores. You go to the spots, they're right where all of us growers are. They're not the cheap people anymore because they got to price it out correctly. Shop local, right? Lewis, let's get back to you. You've got a folder in your hand. What were you going to show me? Well, I, oh. say, I mean, you can't, see, they can't see this, but the list of what we're growing today is probably four times what the list was 15 years ago. I mean, Brent's done a great job. He's taken the greenhouse and he's made it his pride and joy. He's, he doesn't take enough credit for what he does. He does a great job out there. It was interesting listening to Brent when he was saying about, you know, not using chemical pesticides and things like that, because, of course, that's one of the things that people are so used to using anyway, isn't it? It's like in their own gardens. But, you know, to know that you're actually buying a quality plant that hasn't been tainted by, by chemicals and, and this whole use oh, yeah. of, of natural enemies of other pests, I mean, it, that, that seems like a pretty rare thing. He's come, he's come a long way with the biologicals. Again, he handles them all. I don't get involved with those whatsoever. If there used to be an aphid problem, there's something out there that controls the aphids. He gets it, buys them, he spreads them around, and they kill the aphids, and then they just kind of fade away. It's amazing how they do it now. You buy things by the billions, and then you put them in the fertilizer, and next thing you know, you're watering the plants, and these little nematodes or whatever are being spread around the greenhouse, and they're destroying some of the bugs or some of the viruses that are out there that will hurt a plant. They do a great job must be something that you have to constantly stay on top of because we're always hearing about, you know, the trees here in Connecticut being attacked by bugs and things. So, I mean, you know, with climate change and whatever, this must be something that Brent's constantly having to probably keep on top of. We have a closed environment. Everything's encased. We have nothing outside growing pretty much. Everything's inside the greenhouse. So we can't control our environment to a certain point. So we're not letting in some of those other problems. Our greenhouses used to be 100% glass greenhouses. As we said, we changed it after the hurricane. We had to replace the glass. Back in the 70s and 80s, we started switching over to Lexan, which is a double-pane plastic with ribs. And that has um, allowed me to cut back on some of the heat loss. You're still heating as much, but the loss, it's not just a piece of glass between you and the outside. Now it's a double-pane poly, poly, polyethylene material that um, kind of traps the heat in. And it does work. It has worked well over the years. So it's like the double-glazed windows that we have, but the greenhouse equivalent. Pretty much, and there is an air pocket in between. 
as we said, the business has been going for many years. It's still continuing, obviously, very successfully. It seems like a strange question to ask, but what does the future hold for this business, for you, for the family, do you think? That's a very good question. I don't have a good answer because my family, as my two sons, they're both into it. Their children at this point in time don't seem to be involved in the business whatsoever. Lewis's two kids are not involved whatsoever. Brent has four children, and God knows what's going to happen. But, you know, it doesn't seem that there's a want, but there wasn't with Brent growing up either. You never know. And a little bit like yourself, you said earlier, you didn't want to get into the no. business, but then here you still are. Yeah, all my cousins, my dad and his three brothers, all had children, but none of them stayed in the area except me. And I seemed to be the one that stayed in town and uh, just came into the business. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, to your son, Lewis, to, to Brent as well. Thank you for letting us just scratch the surface, as it were, but letting us inside the behind the scenes, as it were, of what it takes to obviously, you know, make these beautiful flowers available to uh, people like myself and obviously all of your other customers. So to you, Lewis, the other Lewis, to Brent, continued success, obviously, with Jewett City Florist and Greenhouse. And thanks ever so much for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for including us in one of your podcasts. This is a first time for me. I think Lewis might have done a fire. He, might, he is the chief of the fire department in Jewett City, so he's very involved in the community. Very, very involved. Brent's very involved with Little League and sports with his kids. So we're all involved in Jewett City. I just love Jewett City. It's just part of me, so I'm going to be here. And for more details about Jewett City Florist and Greenhouse and to order flowers and see what else they have in store, visit their website at jewettcityflorist.com or give them a visit at 17 Ashland Street, Jewett City. <music> Looking for a -a one-of-a-kind experience this season? Visit Wicked Tulips, the place where happiness blooms. Imagine walking through more than 700,000 tulips of all different shapes, colors, and scents. You can find just that at our farm in Preston, Connecticut. We're open seven days a week through the month of May, and entry is ticket only. Ready to tiptoe through the tulips? What are you waiting for? Just go to wickedtulips.com for more. You love cookies, so you are going to love the ARC's Golden Chip Giveaway. Find the Golden Chip and select the bags of the ARC Eastern Connecticut's Classic Crunch Chocolate Chip Cookies and win a free platter of cookies. Visit the ARCECT.com to find a cookie retailer near you and how eating our cookies support jobs for people with disabilities. Visit our cookie factory at 22 Route 171 in Woodstock, Connecticut. Golden Chips may be hiding in bags there too. Get buying, start winning. Dreaming of a brighter future? Want to take classes but can't find the time? East Con's adult programs offer free classes and training programs that work with even the busiest schedule. Classes are flexible and designed to support you when you are available, even if your schedule changes every week. If you want to earn your high school diploma, improve your English, prepare for American citizenship, or explore career training options, East Con is here for you. We offer free in-person and online classes. Go to eastcon.org and click on adult and community programs. Get started today. It's mulch season, so come and visit Green Valley Tree LLC. We have a variety of colors for all your landscaping needs. Buy as much or as little as you want. Pick it up or we can deliver to your door. Call Green Valley Tree LLC for all your mulch, plant health care, and tree service needs at 860-234-4041. We are family owned and fully licensed. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week, sponsored by... You may think you need to travel to large medical centers to get the latest cancer clinical trials. But at Eastern Connecticut Hematology and Oncology, or ECHO, we offer dozens of leading clinical trials, matching clinical trials to the needs of our patients and getting studies opened in just days, giving our patients the latest innovation in cancer care. To learn more about our cutting-edge research, visit echoassociates.org trials. Kevin Blacker, the outspoken critic of the Connecticut Port Authority, has admitted in an interview with the Dane newspaper and Connecticut East this week that he was responsible for painting pink stripes on the doors of the Capitol building recently. Blacker has been at loggerheads with the Port Authority and the Lamont administration for the last five years over the state pier project, which remains unfinished and has ballooned from $93 million to around $255 million. Blacker said he's tried to do things the right way, but that's got him nowhere. 
I've done everything that I could within the rules. And when that doesn't suffice, then you go outside of the rules because the capital and the government has made it clear the laws don't apply up there. They've broken, they violated antitrust laws, illegal hiring, skipping meetings, trampled all over and violated FOIA laws. So they're not following the laws. So I'm not going to either. Black had previously painted signs at State Pier in New London pink in protest of the project and says the use of the pink paint goes back to the Little Pink House in the eminent domain court case of 2005 of Kello versus City of New London that saw property seized by the state and ended in sweeping reforms of eminent domain laws nationwide. It's a reference to the government abuses down at Fort Trumbull where the government you know, took a lot of property by eminent domain. It's just a total government abuse, government overreach. Reach, and I see similarities in what's happening at State Pier in New London. Blacker says he does not intend to pay for the damage he caused and said the cost should be added to the State Pier project, which remains unfinished and in need of yet more money from the state and its partners to complete it. Connecticut College is back in the spotlight as the school announced recently that outgoing President Catherine Bergeron will not attend the school's upcoming commencement ceremony in May. Bergeron stepped down from her position after protests from students and faculty earlier this year demanding her removal as well as allegations that she had a bullying management style. Chris Steiner is Professor of Art History and Anthropology at the college and said despite everything that's happened to date, they are still being ignored by the school's board of trustees. We're not getting much feedback from the board. There is a search committee that's being formed. I think they actually started meeting this week to find the replacement for the full-time president. But in terms of the interim president, which could be a position that lasts as long as a year, maybe even longer, we're really not getting much feedback from the board, and they seem reticent to take the opinion and the viewpoint of the faculty in mind. Bergeron's downfall came after she cancelled a fundraiser at the last minute at a Florida club alleged to have a history of racism and anti-Semitism that brought about the resignation of the school's Dean of Equity and Inclusion. Sam Maidenberg is a student and co-editor of the official student newspaper The College Voice and says with COVID, President Trump and the recent protests on campus, it's been a lot for everyone. I think it's just been so emotionally draining and all over the place for a lot of students. So I think it's definitely a sense of pride to have been involved in something that'll push the college forward and feel like we really left our mark on campus. You know, I feel like I have my physical mark on campus through my work at the College Voice in a lot of ways. And I think other students feel like they have left their mark on campus through the movement that gripped the college for the last few months. Bergeron will not be at the school's commencement ceremony, but said in a brief statement that she will be there in spirit. Members of the non-profit alliance of Northeast Connecticut are taking on the region's transportation problems with a hackathon. The idea is to bring people together to look at what is missing in the area of transportation and what already exists and see how transport resources can be modified and new ones created. Kathleen Crider is from the non-profit Access Community Action Agency heading up the hackathon and says it's a concept anyone can use. So HackCT is what we hope to scale up and out into Connecticut. So we were creating something that can be replicated and then it it can be a roadshow. This can be given to other communities, whether it's a transportation hack, whether it's a different problem that a community needs to solve. If Connecticut as a state understands what a hack is and can roll up their sleeves and dive into a hackathon concept-based way of doing something, Connecticut is on its way to solving its problems. Alison Hennigan is the Director of Marketing and Development for Generations Family Health Centres, one of the Alliance non-profits, and says every day they see the patients they serve miss or put off vital medical appointments because they have no easy way of getting to them. So our patients struggle to get to their appointments, to get to specialty appointments because of the lack of transportation, or if they're able to get transportation, it doesn't run in a timely manner. So they have to take time off from their hourly jobs, leave Danielson at 8 o'clock to get to an appointment in Willimantic that's at noon, and then wait around till 5 o'clock for the next bus to run up there. That's not acceptable for their health or for their income. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East this week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East this week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. 
I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 